Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Red Sea Reefer. Happy birthday to you. Hello and welcome back to the channel. Uh, good news, my Red Sea Reefer is now officially two years old. And to celebrate, I'm gonna do this uh, extra long video and, and walk you through all of uh, my uh, equipment, what I do for filtration, uh, my maintenance schedule, the livestock, the fish, the corals, all of that fun stuff. So in terms of equipment, uh, my Red Sea Reefer 250 liters is lit by three Radeon XR15s. Uh, generation 3s and the circulation and the display is managed by two Ecotech Vortec MP10s and please do check out my video on light and circulation I posted links above. In the sump I have a Bubble King Mini 160 skimmer. I also have a Fosban reactor that's currently running uh, carbon, a few teaspoons of carbon. I'm using the mesh 220 micron filters, which I change about every week, uh, sometimes every two weeks. Uh, I have converted the automatic top off uh, unit, uh, the stock ATO, into a refugium that's actually being fed by the return. And I have uh, a ball of chato that is growing uh, in there right now. It doubles in size about every uh, two weeks. I also have a uh, Kmore F4 wireless doser, it's got four channels and I'm currently dosing uh, Red Sea Foundation buffers A, B and C for alkalinity, calcium and magnesium and uh, occasionally I dose uh, potassium nitrate or uh, Seachem Flourish Phosphorus uh, just to uh, maintain my nutrients at the levels that I uh, like to keep. If you look at the information in the video description, you'll find the parameters that I currently have my uh, tank running at. I also have a Tunzi Osmolator for my top off and I dose calc in my ATO reservoir. There is a video on that if you see the link above. I have an Apex controller with a power 8 bar and a WXM module to control my Ecotech uh, equipment wirelessly. And I've recently just in installed an Apex breakout box with a few float switches in the tank. For maintenance, uh, every week I do a 15 liter water change using the regular instant ocean salt. I also clean the glass in the display using a Tunzi scraper. And then I hand wash the filters that are in the sump. Every six months I take all of the equipment that is in the sump and I put it in this container with uh, a one-to-one -one water and vinegar solution. This includes my osmolator pump, uh, the return line that pumps fresh water back into the tank. Uh, I also have my JCOD return pump in there as well as a skimmer and all the heaters. And I leave them soaking and running for about an hour and then I take them apart and I brush off any de deposits. And I use this opportunity to run a self-cleaning cycle in the sump. Uh, I do this by putting as many power heads in there as possible to kick up the detritus back in solution. And then I use a, another pump to take the water from the sump through the filter socks. So that kind of uh, filters out all of the particles that were uh, that accumulated in the sump over the past six months. So testing is uh, very important in a reef tank. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, you're providing the right water conditions for your uh, corals and your fish to thrive. For the three main parameters, alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium, I really like to use the sulfur kits. I find them very easy to use. They're titration tests. Uh, they're quick to perform, which is really important because if you're testing your water regularly, you don't want to be spending hours or, or a long time testing. So uh, I test alkalinity once a week, uh, sometimes more often if I'm dosing and I'm trying to adjust my levels. Uh, calcium I do once a week, once every two weeks, and magnesium uh, once every two weeks to once a month. For nitrates, I either use a Red Sea Nitrate Pro Kit or uh, the Sulfur uh, Nitrate Kit. And so both have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the Nitrate Pro is more accurate, especially at low levels of uh, 
at low levels of nitrate, so uh, anything that is kind of below uh, uh, two or three. But the disadvantage of the Red Sea kit is that it takes about 15 minutes to perform. Uh, the sulfur nitrate uh, kit, on the other hand, is actually really quick. It's also a colorimetric test, but you could do a test in three minutes. And I find that I could really uh, read it easily if the levels are between, let's say, uh, five to uh, ten parts per million, which is where I keep my tank. So I often end up using the sulfur kit because it's that much quicker and, uh, and I could uh, tell whether my nitrate is like two or uh, uh, five or 10 parts per billion really easily. So for phosphates, most of the time I use the HANA uh, checker, the phosphorus ultra low range. Uh, it's accurate, it's quick. You could do a test in about uh, five minutes or so. Uh, uh, so I really like it. I also have a Red Sea Reef, uh, sorry, a Red Sea Phosphate Pro uh, uh, kit. It's a colorimetric assay. It comes with this uh, fancy little wheel, and you could uh, usually tell apart uh, values that are between zero to 0.16. You know, it works, uh, but it takes about 20 minutes to perform the test. So again, it's just it's way too long. Uh, to be to use it regularly uh, so most of the time I just go with the HANA uh, ultra low uh, range phosphorus and I typically test my phosphates once a week once every two weeks salinity is another parameter that you want to check every week uh, and obviously you want to test your new salt water to make sure it matches the, your uh, tank uh, and I use the Red Sea refractometer I actually find this pretty easy to use uh, one tip is uh, when you store it, don't have the flap, the glass flap, right on the uh, actual refractometer. I like to keep it elevated a little bit. Uh, so this part, I don't push it all the way down. And I find that that kind of helps with maintaining the calibration. Uh, I always calibrate with uh, uh, RODI water. Uh, and I, I know there's a lot of like people out there saying you should use 35 parts per uh, 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 per thousand seawater to calibrate your refractometer. Uh, but you know, there if water RODI water is always going to be zero. Uh, sometimes when you order these uh, chemicals uh, calibration solutions, they might be off depending on how long they've been sitting in storage, or uh, you know, if you open them, then they start to suffer. Uh, from evaporation and there could be patch effects and so on so I rather go with the zero that I always know is going to be zero and just keep everything based on that reference and you know I've done the test guys I've, I've calibrated solutions with RODI as well as the fancy calibration kits and I'm always getting the same values which is about 35 parts per uh, uh, 35 PPTs for uh, for my tank it's good to also have uh, four other kits on hand. Uh, if you're dosing potassium nitrate, it's a good idea to test for potassium. It's, it's always a good idea to test for anything that you're gonna dose for. So if you're dosing potassium nitrate, well, it has nitrate and potassium, so you should be testing for both potassium and nitrate. And you know, I don't do the potassium test all the time, maybe once a month or something, only if I'm dosing. Uh, if you're going to run a QT, and I highly suggest running a QT, quarantining all of your fish, uh, you probably will be uh, treating some fish with copper. And if that's the case, you should have a copper test kit uh, on hand. And then finally, it's always a good idea to have an ammonia as well as a nitrite test kits. Uh, just in case if you're testing your quarantine tank or if you suspect that you're, uh, uh, you know, you had a massive die-off in, uh, in your system and you have ammonia poisoning, it'd be really good to pull out your ammonia kit and, and test the water. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the livestock. And I'll start with the cleanup crew. So I really love my cleanup crew. Uh, I find them to be some of the fascinating uh, animals uh, that are uh, living in my tank. Uh, it's good to have a healthy cleanup crew because you know they're they're the ones that are cleaning your nuisance algae, removing uneating food, uh, and just you know cleaning up your tank essentially. So I have uh, for a cleanup crew, I have uh, two tuxedo blue tuxedo urchins, and they're they're beautiful. They're they're amazing. They have these very bright, vibrant blue uh, stripes, and uh, they go around uh, munching algae off of the rocks. And as you know, as far as urchins go, uh, they are model citizens in my tank. Uh, they are not uh, bulldozing through things. They're not removing things. And most importantly, they're not chewing on wires. 
I also have two starfish. Uh, I don't see them much. Uh, they're uh, nocturnal, but I love when I feed the tank and I see their tentacles come out of the rocks. It's uh, it's pretty uh, creepy. So one is a pink serpent starfish and the other one is a black bristle starfish. Uh, I have a strawberry conch which uh, scoots around the sand bed uh, cleaning the sand and the algae on the sand. I also have a, a cleaner shrimp, a skunk cleaner shrimp uh, that does an amazing job of uh, eating any of the uh, fish food I add to the tank. And to round things off, I have a whole bunch of uh, trochus snails. These are the black-footed snails, as well as some of the sand-dwelling snails like uh, Nasiris and uh, Cerus snails that come out at night to uh, clean any uneaten food and detritus. Okay, let's talk about the fish now. Uh, so I have eight fish in total. Uh, I have uh, two clowns, one yellow tang. I have two wrasses. Uh, a Moyer leopard wrasse and a yellow-tailed tamarind wrasse. I have uh, one yellow, uh, uh, sorry, one blue-green chromis, and uh, one royal gramma, and then uh, one fish that uh, I, I really like to see, but he hides most of the time. It's a yellow watchman gobi, and he's paired up with a candy pistol shrimp, and they live in the right boulder uh, on uh, on right boulder in the tank here. So I've been making a point of trying to quarantine all new fish uh, because uh, you know you don't want to add fish into a tank and then end up with a disease outbreak. It's so much more difficult to deal with disease in a display than it is to do in a quarantine tank. Uh, every time I add a new fish, I try to use an acclimation box just to uh, make sure that uh, there is going to be no aggression or, or to try to get all of the posturing uh, and possible aggression out of the way uh, before the fish is released and interacts with the residents. It just kind of gives the, the new fish a bit of a buffer zone uh, and the old fish a chance to see the fish. If I notice signs of aggression after the new fish is introduced, then what I do is I capture the aggressor, move the aggressor into a new tank for a couple of weeks and then add the aggressor back into the tank. And uh, every single time I've tried that trick, it has worked. And now we're going to talk corals. So you know that I'm a big fan of SPS. Everything that you see here is has been grown from uh, one inch frags. And I've released a video showing the progression of growth from uh, uh, one month uh, all the way to two years uh, for my SPS colonies. So there's a link uh, to that video on the top right hand corner of your screen. Uh, I wanted to share with you uh, the process of introducing uh, SPS into the display. It would be great if you have a separate uh, quarantine system for your SPS frags. Uh, but in the absence of this, the process that I've been following is whenever I get a new frag in, I actually remove the, uh, the acro from the base of the fra uh, frag plug and throw away the old frag plug. And, uh, and you're essentially losing a bit of tissue and you're potentially damaging the coral by cutting it but it's peace of mind because almost all of the hitchhikers that are gonna be coming into your system are actually gonna be on the frag plug itself. Then, I, if you have a microscope, have a good look at the frag that you just got, uh, noting any uh, uh, red, uh, red bugs or uh, acro-eating flatworms. And I still dip the frags, uh, the, the sticks that I just cut in Revive. Then I mount it on a fresh flag pl uh, frag plug and I introduce it into my system. And then I would actually keep it uh, somewhere temporary and I would re-dip it every week uh, for three weeks. So I do three dips. And then after the third dip, it's ready to go in its final place. Um, it's not, you know, th this method is not foolproof. You could still get uh, some hitchhikers, but by removing the frag plug and dipping and inspecting the uh, uh, the frag, you're, you're a long way towards protecting your uh, tank from uh, from uh, uh, diseases that uh, or pests that would affect your acros. And if you, I'm not sure if you noticed, but the coral that we're looking right down smack in the center right here, shockaholic slash habanero, uh, it has it's brown. This thing used to be like bright neon green. Uh, I had like a major alkalinity swing uh, several uh, uh, about a month ago, where my alkalinity dropped from 8.5 or something to 6.8 and it upset a few of my corals, the, the Shockaholic, as well as the Miyagi Torch you'll see now. Uh, but other than that, I'm, I'm pretty happy with my uh, colors. Uh, I'm not dosing anything, I'm not feeding, I mean, I'm dosing alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium, but I'm not dosing anything for coral colors, I'm not adding amino, I'm not feeding the corals in any way, uh, I'm just letting them do their thing. Here, here is the Miyagi Torch, you see that it's, uh, 
you know it's it's not looking its usual glorious self uh you know a year ago i would have freaked out and started like uh, trying to do stuff and and feed things and and add add uh, additives for color but i'm just gonna let the uh, let this play out okay guys uh that's it thank you so much for uh watching it's uh it's been a pleasure uh doing this over the past two years and and uh I am I'm gonna keep this tank I, I know this is about the time where people start thinking about upgrading but I really want to see this tank through and and I, I, I wanna I wanna get to a point where it just looks like a mature reef so uh, uh, stay tuned I'm gonna continue doing my uh, update uh, update videos I have a new project coming up but it's it's a new build so I'm, I'm still gonna keep this tank but it's uh, <laughs> it's it's a new build you'll you'll see shortly uh, it, it's a bit of a challenge for me, but stay tuned. And as always, if you have any comments or questions, please leave them below. And I, I truly appreciate uh, subscriptions and, and uh, your thumbs up. Thank you so much and see you around.